After posting my original video on note-taking here on my YouTube channel, I got a lot of questions about how to take notes in your own words. Hi, my name is Morgan. I am a PhD candidate in performance studies, and I have a lot of thoughts about writing. So let's dive in. Here is a question that I got from A.T. Antoine Williams, who asks, What tips do you have for putting thoughts into your own words? I'm working on setting up my Settlecaston using Obsidian, but I have trouble paraphrasing and will often just enter in notes word for word, which feels like I'm just parroting the original material without any original thought. In school, we're often told to write in our own words when the teacher wants us to paraphrase what somebody else has said. But I think that there is a much larger conversation to be had here, and this viewer's question gets at the heart of what I think the problem is with calling paraphrasing writing in your own words because ultimately the goal of this person is to create original thought and paraphrasing somebody else's thought is not original thought. In my current understanding of note-taking, note-taking has two main purposes. Firstly, to learn and memorize information that you are taking in. And secondly, to document your thoughts, satisfy your curiosities, and produce original content. I find that in school, we are really encouraged to take notes for the first purpose of note-taking. I would sit in a lecture for two plus hours listening to a lecturer speak to me about the readings that we had done, and I would take notes about what they were saying for the sole purpose of being able to regurgitate that information on a test that I would take at the end of the year. So my priority was understanding and memorizing and learning information that somebody else was giving me. And that's great, and your Settlecaston can be used for that purpose for sure, but personally I think education about how to take notes for the second purpose, to create your own information and to satisfy your curiosity, is largely lacking in the education system. And that second purpose of note-taking is largely what I use the Tettelkasten method for. In fact, that was the goal of Lumen when he first started using his slipbox method, was to conduct research and produce papers, which he did ad nauseum. <laughs> so this video will touch a little bit on the first purpose of note-taking, how to take notes in your own words so that you learn something better through things like paraphrasing, but really where the heart of this video will be is in that second purpose of note-taking, how to find your own voice and and take notes in your own words and your own thoughts to develop your own sense of creativity, critical thinking, and produce original writing. I want to break this video up into two parts. The first part will be identifying examples of what is not writing in your own words so that we can identify maybe what we could do better in our note-taking practice. And then the second part will be offering some tips and tricks that I use to help find my writerly voice and identify the things that I want to be writing about. What are some examples of things that are not your own words? First of all, other people's words. If you claim other people's words are your own words, this is also called theft of intellectual property, copyright infringement, if you're in school, then academic dishonesty and plagiarism. This is not something you want to do. Plus, if you take someone else's words as your own, either because you've paid someone to write a paper for you or you're trying to claim existing words, ultimately, you won't have learned anything from that experience and it won't make you a better writer. So if you want to learn and if you want to come up with original thought, just don't do this. Give yourself enough time to do the writing and note-taking that you need to do to meet your goals. And this can happen accidentally if we forget what is someone else's words and what is our own words. So also set up fail-safes in your Zettelkasten system so that you never misunderstand who is saying what within your notes. I do use other people's words within some of my notes, and we'll talk about that next, but I actually strictly follow MLA formatting within my Obsidian, which sounds a bit odd in my own personal note-taking, but really it helps me remember what is a quote and where that quote came from without fail. I use block quotes, and I use in-text citations, and I use MLA formatting of citations, the whole bit, and I never get confused. The second second thing that are not your own words are quotes. And like I just said, I do use quotes in my notes, even though it's not writing in my own words. So when is it adequate to use a quote instead of paraphrasing that person's thought? Usually when that person has said something so perfectly, you want to capture exactly the way that they said it within the idea that you want to add to it. And that second part's important because if you use a quote within your notes, you should still be paraphrasing or summarizing that quote in your own words to make sure that one, you actually know what the quote has said, and 
two, to understand for yourself what about that quote was interesting or important to you. Every person that reads that quote is going to have a different understanding of why that quote is interesting or worth saving in its entirety. So you need to write down for your own sake why that quote was important to you, why it jumped out at you, and that is going to create further thought down the line. And there might be 10 reasons why this quote was interesting to you. So you should create 10 new notes within your Zettelkasten that are actually your own words and your own thoughts about someone else's words. The third thing that are not your own words are paraphrases. And yes, technically, you're using words that are not the original author's words, but you're still documenting their thoughts. You still need to cite that if you're writing a paper. So that said, when I do paraphrase somebody else's words within my notes, I always cite it in MLA formatting. I document the author, the text, and the page number, where this idea came from, even if I'm not quoting them directly. I want to maintain that lineage of knowledge being passed from one theorist to another, even within my notes, especially within my notes, because hopefully these notes are going to carry me through the next couple decades of writing, and I want to remember where my thought came from so that I can return to that thought if I need to, and just so that I can respect and honor what that thinker has given to me. The next things that are not your own words are cliches and transition phrases. In other words, only time will tell, but to put two and two together, all the glitters is not gold. That's an example of a string of cliches in which I have said a lot of words, but all put together, I didn't really say anything with those words. I'm gonna look back on that sentence in 10 years and I'm gonna wonder what the heck I was talking about. Cliches are repetitive phrases that ultimately become meaningless because they are used so often by so many people. This doesn't mean that you can never use them. Maybe they really will help your note taking and help you understand what you meant by a note, but I would tread carefully because you risk saying nothing at all. And the same thing goes for transition phrases. Each of your notes should be as small as possible, so there should be no reason really to transition anywhere within that note. Maybe you want to introduce transition phrases later in your actual writing project, but transition phrases are kind of similar to cliches in that they don't really tell us a lot. If I start my final paragraph with to conclude, what has that given anyone? They know it's the final paragraph. I can just conclude and they will figure it out. So to make sure that you still know what your notes are saying a decade from now or more, try to avoid cliches and transition phrases within your notes. And the last and most insidious way that other people's words leak into your own words is when you write what you think your teacher thinks you should write. And this doesn't just apply to teachers, this can apply to anyone who you end up writing for because you want them to be impressed by what you find interesting rather than just trusting what you find interesting to be interesting to other people. Sometimes when we write a paper for class, we appear to be writing in our own words with our own ideas, but we are actually just repackaging the teacher's ideas into new words that we think they will like. So we end up not not writing in our own words, but rather we write in the words of the person that we think our teacher wants us to be to get the grade. And I totally get that. And if you have to do that to get the grade, then by all means do it. But be aware of the persona that you're adopting to do that. And notice how you may or may not agree with that person. Because when you go to publish, we, the readers, want to hear what you actually think about a topic. Your words and ideas are valuable to the world. So what can we do to combat that and truly develop ideas and a voice that are our own? either for pure memorization or to come up with something brand new. My first tip is to practice noticing. And this is a tip that I got from the book Several Short Sentences About Writing by Verlin Klinkenborg. In this book on page 37, he writes, if you notice something, it's because it's important. And what you're interested in tends to be what you notice. If a sentence or a word jumps out at you from the page, you can stop reading in that moment. You can linger in that word for a while before jumping to any conclusions or reading between the lines or looking for the underlying meaning or message of this text, simply bask in that thing that you've noticed for itself. Reflect on why that thing jumped out at you. And maybe it has nothing to do with what the author was saying overall. Maybe you just like the sound of that word 
heard, in which case you can get curious about that sound. Who else is using words that sound like this? What words are adjacent to that word? And how does that change the sound of that word? What is the etymology of that word? Why did the author choose this word and not a different word? I don't know what you find interesting, and maybe you don't know what you find interesting. Take a little extra time with stuff, and if you notice something shine a bit brighter for you, whether it be a number, a word, a sentence, an object, a memory, something your teacher said, something on the ground in the hallway, a discussion with a friend, etc. The list goes on. If you notice something amidst the world of somethings, then sit with that for a while. That is how you will start to develop your own interests. This brings me to the second way that you can start to find your own words, and that is once you've noticed something, approach it from different directions. And this tip comes from Matthew Goulish in his essay Criticism from his book 39 Micro Lectures in Proximity of Performance. Ghoulish writes, quote, how do we approach something? We approach it from any direction. We approach it using our eyes, our ears, our noses, our intellects, our imaginations. We approach it with silence. We approach it with childhood. We use pain or embarrassment. We use history. We take a safe route or a dangerous one. We discover our approach and we follow it." End quote. And there is no wrong direction to approach something from, just like there is no wrong thing to notice. The thing that you have noticed, whatever it is, is important, and the direction that you approach it from will shift that thing in different ways, some of which you'll want to pursue, some of which you won't. But there are infinite ways to approach that thing. So maybe your teacher has given you an article to read, Maybe you like the article, maybe you don't. But there are many things you can ask about this article, like when was it written? Who was it written by? What was happening in the world at that time? Is there a feminist perspective we could take to this article? Did the author use like a casual voice and personal pronouns? And how did that make you feel while reading that article? Could you use this article to actually go and interpret your favorite novel or TV show through? Does this article remind you of your favorite Taylor Swift song or something that you heard elsewhere? This is not limited to texts either. This applies to absolutely anything you notice. There are infinite directions you can approach it from, and each direction is going to elicit a different line of thought. And that line of thought is going to be uniquely your own, and you can turn that thought into individual notes. There is no wrong thought to think, and there is no wrong note to take from that thought. Number three, tap into your emotions and curiosities. I did an exercise in class with my students the other day that I thought was actually really fruitful. We had just seen a video of a piece of performance art, and I asked everyone to take just two or three minutes and write down three sentences. Those sentences were first, I feel blank, second, I wonder blank, and third, I think blank, where the I feel question had to actually be an emotion. They couldn't just say, I feel like this was bad. No, I feel uncomfortable, or I feel overjoyed, or I feel disgusted, and then why you had that feeling. So tap into your emotions, because that is a place where you can find information. And then the second sentence, I wonder. This is where you can let your curiosity run wild. I wonder why she performed it this way and not this way. I wonder what a different approach might have looked like. I wonder how other people from other backgrounds felt while watching this. And then finally, I had them write what they think about this piece. And that was often informed by what they felt and what they wondered. Speaking of thinking, my fourth tip for writing in your own words and voice is write <laughs> to discover what you think. We're sort of implicitly taught in school that thinking comes first and writing comes second, but that's usually not the case. In his book, Klinkenborg says, quote, writing becomes intrinsic to the act of thinking, completely intertwined with it, end quote. Thought and writing emerge together through the act Act of putting pen to paper or putting fingers to keyboard. So one great thing you can do for yourself to develop your own voice and your own words and discover what interests you is to keep a journal. Some people do this directly in their obsidian. They take daily fleeting notes or journal entries within their obsidian and they name those files in a certain way. Personally, I picked up a bunch of similar cheap pretty journals from chapters, and I really enjoy writing in them. I even picked up the blank one so that my thoughts are even less restricted and they can come out in whatever form I have them. Again, there is no wrong thing to write about in your journal. The goal is to start writing and the thoughts will come. So do not wait for inspiration to start writing and thinking. Inspiration comes after you've begun the writing process. And my fifth tip for writing in your own words and finding your own writerly voice is 
to trust yourself and value your own thoughts and interests. The things that interest you are valid. It doesn't matter if it's the video game you're playing, the meal that you're cooking yourself for dinner, the book you just read. As I said in my first video, all of these things are sources of knowledge and sources of thought and places where we can start developing original work from. Everything you do has so much innate value in it. Everything in the world is math is engineering, is marketing, is chemistry, is biology, and physics, and performance, and language, and art, and sociology, and anthropology, and environmental studies. These academic fields, they emerge from the world. Every one of those fields can be found in every single thing that you do or witness, whether it is sitting on your couch watching Netflix and examining the engineering and the physical properties and the color and the design of the furniture furniture on which your butt is placed, or maybe it's the acting in the show that you're watching, the color scheme, the choice of fashion design for your favorite character. All of these things are important things to notice, and what makes them important is the fact that you noticed them. So we have come a long way, I think, from A.T. Antoine Williams' original question, but that is what I wanted to say in response, is that having original thought takes practice, and all thoughts that you have are valuable. It doesn't matter if your original material is a piece of writing that you've read or the couch that you're sitting on. Yes, you can use the direct quote, and yes, you can paraphrase that quote, but then I encourage that you take that thought further by tapping into your emotions and curiosities, by approaching it from different directions, by seeing what you notice when you examine that material, and by trusting all of those thoughts that are emerging. Thank you for watching, everybody. Martin Adams made a very similar YouTube video recently on the importance of curiosity in your subtle cast and system, so I will link that below. We got a little philosophical there for a bit, so I'm gonna get off my soapbox now and read your comments in the comment section. Do you have any other tips that are maybe a little more concrete for finding your own words and using your own voice and coming up with original content to put into your notes within your subtle cast and system? I would love to hear all of your tips and tricks and musings and philosophies as well. Thank you for being here. I am so grateful for every one of you that has subscribed recently. See you in the comments and in another video soon.